Welcome to Byteside. I'm Seamus Byrne. This is a show about tech and media and all sorts of interesting things. Today I have a great guest with me, Dr. Rosie Barnes. She is a mechanical engineer working in clean and renewable energy and runs the Engineering with Rosie YouTube channel. I'm a fan of cutting edge tech and using media in new and clever ways, so I couldn't resist taking the chance to pick Rosie's brain on the tech of clean energy, on the effort to communicate about it to the world, and what it means to add visibility to women in engineering. Ray Rosie, thank you so much for joining me on Byteside. Thanks for having me, and um, thanks for the nostalgia of your intro sound. That's been a while since I... <laughs> since I heard that one in real life. So that's cool. Yeah, look, uh, that my honest uh, effort there was when I was trying to think of uh, of intro music for Byteside at one point, I just went, I'm just, I'm just going to use, I'm just going to use a modem noise and that's going to make it pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. Young people won't know what that is. Like people probably younger than, I don't know, 30 wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't know yeah. what that is. <laughs> <laughs> and it actually has a beautiful, I only realized when I put it in editing software, it has a beautiful, you know, uh, spectrographic, uh, you know, sort of visualization uh, oh, yeah. inside the editing software. And I was like, that's quite cool, actually. That'd be, you know, probably that could be the, the graphic for the show as well. <laughs> yeah, it should. <laughs> so look, can you give us the big picture of, you know, who is Rosie? Well, yeah, I'm an engineer. I've been an engineer for about 20 years. Um, I did my bachelor degree was in system engineering, which is kind of like a bit of everything and how all different kinds of engineering relate together. And I also did a philosophy degree um, undergraduate. Um, so that was really fun. And it's something that I use all the time. I know people think arts degrees aren't that useful, but they are even in something, you know, you might think is totally opposite to it, like engineering. Um, then I went and worked in industry. I worked on a range of different kinds of renewable energy technologies, solar, um, some sustainability stuff, some wind energy stuff. And then um, around 2010, I started to get really frustrated with the politics of the energy transition and especially in, in Australia. Um, so about 2012, I went back to uni um, to get a PhD and I chose a renewable energy project. It was an um, structural design wind turbine blades um, with the intention that I would get a job overseas, work in manufacturing and, you know, like wind energy at that time was really close to being as like cheap as fossil fuels, um, but wasn't quite yet. And so... I just really wanted to be part of that, um, you know, that to me, that was the most impactful thing that I could work on was <laughs> getting to the point where it was renewables were just cheaper than fossil fuels. So we didn't have to win this political or moral argument that yeah. we were losing. It felt <laughs> at the time and felt like that most of the time since actually in Australia. Um, yeah. And, and we did that, you know, I worked in, I worked in the wind industry then wind turbine factories, climbing up wind turbines. Oh. It was really fun. Um, yeah, and then during the pandemic, it became hard to live overseas. My partner was with me over there, but still working in Australia. So he, he couldn't, he had to come back every now and then. And um, at one point he came back and it was so hard to get into Australia. He's like, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> leaving again. again. <laughs> so it's like, well, okay. Yeah, I better come home then. And it was a good opportunity for me to branch out into a range of different stuff, not just wind, but yeah, now I'm working a lot on energy storage because like I said, you know, I really wanted to do that really impactful thing to get renewable electricity cheaper than fossil fuels. And, and we've actually done that, you know, um, I think people sometimes think we haven't made any um, progress in the energy transition, but to me, that's huge. You know, that big thing that I, I wanted to do in 2010, that has been achieved now. And now it's other other aspects of the energy transition that, um, yeah, that need attention. So happy to work on that. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. And so with all of that background, I guess, you know, was it pandemic related or was it just a, a vision to, to help kind of explain this kind of thing that you decided to kick off a YouTube channel? It's, uh, it's really a pandemic cliche. I remember reading an article <laughs> that um, podcasting microphones were like in short supply around the world because everybody during that yeah. first lockdown, everyone was buying them and I was one of them. I um, had just gotten a redundancy from the job that I had, I was intending to relocate elsewhere in Europe to another job in the industry, but um, all of that just totally dried up. So I 
was in lockdown and um, had, you know, not that much to do. And I had some videos that I wanted to make. I'd been working with the communication department of my old company. Uh, I remember this one project. I just really wanted to feature the wind turbines in the area I was living in Denmark. It's like a historical museum of wind turbine development. And, you know, I'm, I'm such a, a nerd, but I, to <laughs> me, that's like the, <laughs> the coolest thing. And I was trying to convince them to, you know, make this video and it turned into this committee and we, you know, everyone had different <laughs> ideas and we're having weekly meetings and budgets need to be approved. And then, so when I got this redundancy, I'm like, oh, I can just make this on my own. So I got, I bought a selfie stick and a microphone and I just drove around and I, I made the video and yeah, then I um, thought of another video I wanted to make and then another one and I just kept on doing it. So yeah, that's as much as I planned it out. I, I didn't have a plan at the start. Um, yeah. It's been really, really good. <laughs> well, look, I'm pleased you did because as much as all those microphones did sell out during the pandemic, <laughs> I think there's sometimes, I feel like there's sometimes that almost the opposite side of the Dunning-Kruger problem where, you know, people who have expertise sometimes almost also kind of recognize that it's like, well, I mean, I'm not the best person in my field. And so they shy away from trying to do that thing of sharing their knowledge because, oh, well, you know, other people could probably do this better than I could. Whereas all the people who've only got a smidgen of knowledge are probably the ones who end up launching their channels and just running with it. And you're like, damn it, I should have done it. So at least, you know, good on you for diving in. <laughs> Yeah, and it's also partly you get the wrong idea before you start because I remember um, searching one idea I had was to make a video about why wind turbines have three blades because everyone always asks me that at parties when they find out <laughs> that's what I do. Why do wind turbines have three blades? And I knew that the most popular YouTube videos on that topic are, are basically wrong. You know, they give a, <laughs> the, a wrong explanation on it. Yep. So, And they've got millions of views, like maybe 5 million views. And so I saw that. I'm like, oh, that's not even right. I'll, I'll just yeah. make a video that's accurate and I'll have like more than 5 million views. It'll be, you know, be easy. And I didn't realize that, yeah, YouTube doesn't really care if you're, <laughs> if, you... <laughs> if you're accurate <laughs> for some reason. Um, and later on, I found there's plenty of good videos on why wind turbines have three blades. It's just that the, you know, the algorithm doesn't pick it up for whatever reason. So, um, yeah. but by that point I was, you know, I don't know, too far sucked in and <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. just like, really, I really enjoyed the community of it. And also it's a really different audience to who I can speak to as a professional. You know, I talk a lot with other engineers and we're all of a certain type, you know, a lot of the stereotypes are true. Um, and so it's nice to talk with people who are interested in these issues, but they have really different questions, um, really different concerns. And I think that understanding that makes the technology development much better because you end up with something that people, people want and you don't, you know, get surprised by community opposition to something that seems totally benign to an engineer, but, you know, isn't to other people. Yeah. So look, let's talk a bit about, you know, I guess, you know, you've, you've touched on it quite well at the start there about why, you know, you really believe it's an important time for clean energy. But, you know, what do you feel like are some of the most important things that people, you know, should try to understand or that you, you know, are keen to help people understand about energy tech right now? It's usually a lot about the the trade-offs you know you see a lot of reporting about uh you know like maybe environmental impact of um wind turbine blades if they can't be recycled or mining that you have to do to um to you know produce the minerals that you need to make batteries or generators or any of the other clean energy technologies and i just see like a lack of context and a lack of like grown-up um comparison of yeah. okay yes everything has an, an impact and i mean it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that um you know if you want to have physical stuff that physical stuff needs to come from somewhere originally and it's nearly always like if you didn't grow it above the ground then you you mind it um so it's a matter of uh, do we want better things now than what we had before um you know trying to give that context and then trying to get people to understand what are the easy problems to solve and what are the hard ones um because i think sometimes you know people go on and on about problems that are, are not going to be that difficult to solve like 
yeah, wind turbine blade recycling is is not nearly the the, the big problem that you, you think it is if you put it in context of you know all the other kinds of waste and yeah um yeah if we really wanted to recycle it and we're prepared to pay for it then we would be able to and then what's a what's a hard problem um you know and then that might be so okay so electricity is fairly easy to decarbonize ninety percent of the way. But what's really hard is cement, and that's actually, you know, um, 8% of the world's emissions. And I'll talk about why is that hard to decarbonize? Why can't you just, you know, put green electricity into it and have the product come out green? So, yeah, it's a lot about helping people understand what's the, the hard problems and, and what's the easy ones. And I guess my hope is that when people are more educated about that, then, you know, maybe politicians will see my channel and, and get a bit more informed themselves or maybe regular people will be better informed and elect better um, politicians to drive policy. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the goals. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point that there's so many of the debates that we almost kind of seem to get forced into around some of these things where you're like, yeah, that there are kind of much better debates we could be having about you know how you kind of achieve certain outcomes if we can just get past some of these, yeah, really sort of easy ones that you almost feel like, how did we not get past this debate 10 years ago? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so look, yeah, let's um, talk about the fact that obviously, you know, you're a woman in engineering you've, in 20 years. So clearly when you first entered the space, you know, I guess there was probably, you know, a lot less sort of women around the industry than maybe now, or hopefully it's been improving um but you know i guess how do you feel about you know that kind of taking on that role of, of visibility in that way and helping other people see you know that there are you know other women out there who love this stuff yeah well all through my career i've always you know anytime that someone wants to make a, a corporate video or um you know have a volunteer for a panel or you know, anytime there's going to be some communication about engineering then i've always volunteered because i'm like it might as well be a, a woman that <laughs> that's talking about engineering because that's my kind of favorite kind of um activism or my preferred like for, for me personally i'm yeah. glad other people are doing other harder stuff but for me i i just want to show people you know, I am a woman and I am engineering and I do know what I'm talking about. And, you know, just I think that I assume subtly that's got to build up and, um, you know, have people realize that this is quite normal. I don't think the numbers are changing that much. Definitely not as fast as I probably assumed they would when I was yeah. at university. Um, and I definitely would never tell, uh, you know, young women who want to study engineering I would never tell them that there's, it's not going to be an issue for them because there is heaps of sexism all, all the way through. And it usually starts in, you know, um, when kids are really young, even babies, you know, people treat babies differently depending on if it's a girl or a boy baby, um, and, you know, in terms of what toys they give them to play with and yeah. how, uh, how much time teachers let kids talk for is also gendered and, you know, all the way up through to... Um, you know, girls maybe not being encouraged in, in maths. Um, I was pretty lucky that I never noticed any of that. I remember I was in year 12 when we had a relief teacher in physics and I remember there was, um, was 15 people in the class, <laughs> six girls and nine boys, and the relief teacher said, wow, it's great to see so many girls in this physics class. And I, I had never, literally never occurred to me that this yeah. was not a normal girly thing to do. And I, cause that's, that's why I remember the numbers because I counted. I'm like, it's not yeah. even half. What are you talking yeah. about? That's so weird. Um, and then later that year, I went on a women in engineering camp at the university and I'm like, why is there a women in engineering camp? And, um, yeah, unfortunately, shortly after that, I, I <laughs> experienced plenty of, of, um, reasons why it's, there aren't so many women in engineering. And I definitely, you know, like I had a maths lecturer try and convince me to drop down a, a level in maths uh, or to drop maths <laughs> altogether yeah. based on just one bad semester, um, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's been hard, but so that all sounds very negative. I also do tell young women that it gets better. It gets, it gets way better as you get experience. You know, the hardest time is when you're studying and when you're trying to get your first job, when there's not so much to distinguish you from other people. But 
once you've got just a few projects under your belt um, and even if you are careful with the you know extracurricular stuff you do at university you'll distinguish yourself and there aren't so many engineers that people can be picky enough about oh well I would like this candidate the experience is great but unfortunately she's a woman like they just you know there's never that many candidates to choose from that you can be that picky and the few it's very rare that you get someone who's like really blatantly explicitly sexist and when you do encounter someone like that it's just really nice that they're so sexist they would never want to work with you because you wouldn't (laughs) want to work with them either so yeah (laughs) and look yeah I think for a long time in so many industries uh that yeah there's that awkward part of it all where the main kinds of panels that people would you know invite sort of women to would be the women in engineering panel you know and not the everything else about engineering panel <laughs> um you know it's like in in the conference circuit and things is that something that you know people or i don't know if that's something you're aware of but you know is there a bit more of a sense of you know trying to make sure that you know all voices are, are in the mix yeah it's getting way better and that's actually um one area where i feel like the australian conferences are trying harder than the european ones yeah cool um there's definitely people are aware of this concept of a you know a mantle where you have only only yes. men on a, a panel it's a bad look now that twitter exists you, you know <laughs> someone's gonna tweet it yeah. <laughs> and um yeah so people are trying pretty hard to make sure that doesn't happen and not just that it's not just token women anymore you know people are making sure that you know because um often there would be like a female moderator and then all the experts would be men and that's like maybe hurts more than it helps because it kind of reinforces the idea that women aren't experts yeah Um, i'd better ask these men about the thing yeah yeah and you'd like be a social facilitator and stuff so Mm. i personally love moderating panels um because it's a lot less work than presenting (laughs) but (laughs) but (laughs) you know you need to have some um some female experts and they usually are now too so i i find that pretty pretty good now that's something that we're huge difference has been made and even just the last you know like two or three years it's it's gotten a lot better yeah cool um so you know around the youtube side of things then i i really think working in a kind of a niche space is probably quite a tricky thing there of you know keeping it interesting and approachable but also being informative to people who really care about the niche you know how do you manage that sort of you know balancing act when you're trying to think of things that you want to cover and and the kinds of people that you talk to um, I think that the quick answer is um, engaging with the community a lot. And uh, like I mentioned at the start, that's what I love about YouTube is the community. So that is no challenge for me. I really like to do that. And I have a, you know, a Patreon group where I talk to with them a lot. We've got a Discord server and um, I use a community tab and I'm always in my comments. So that's that's good. But the bigger picture is that I've been really focused on the the long term of the channel um, in terms of what will keep my interest for the longest. I'm not really focused a lot on on growth. I have my own business, you know, engineering consulting business where I'm, um, you know, that's where I make my money. Um, (laughs) The YouTube does help to bring um, clients to me for that. So I won't say that I get nothing out of the the YouTube. Um, But I know that if I just chase views and make the videos that are popular and, you know, I have had a few hits, um, you know, some have several hundred thousand views and other ones have only, uh, you know, maybe 5,000 views or actually the favorite video I ever made. I, I think it has like 2000 views and it, <laughs> it took me like two weeks, probably of nearly full-time work to make it. I made this t- uh, wind turbine out of gingerbread and, oh, then, wow. <laughs> and then tested it. I think it's fantastic and no one likes it apparently. So, um, I will you find know, it. Like, I, I will was... put that link in the, you know, in the show notes <laughs> for this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, and then there was a Netflix, Netflix show about, um, baconeering, baking engineering. Um, they made a gingerbread wind turbine on it, but it didn't even work. Mine, you know, wind blew, it turned hell? it, it made <laughs> electricity and Netflix did not invite me to be a judge on that show. And I just, I can't believe it. You're like, here it is right here. I have done it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I wrote outraged uh, messages to everyone I could find on social media. Um, so maybe season two. I'm, um, yeah, I'm hopeful. 
Yeah. But yeah, the videos that have um, hundreds of thousands of views, they're not, they're not my favorite. And some of them, like the um, comments, the people that are commenting, the type of viewer it attracts, I don't, I don't like them. You know, I know they're not my, they're not my people. I don't want to engage with them. Yeah. And if I was really cynically trying to grow the channel, I'd be making more videos like that. And in the short term, I would make more money and, you know, have the prestige of a, you know, maybe a hundred thousand subscriber channel. But um, I know in the long term, I would, I would burn out from that. And in yeah. fact, I did, I did have a, you know, near miss with burnout really early on in my YouTube days when I tried for two or three months to release weekly. And it was crazy how fast yeah. that, that burnt me out. So now I know <laughs> I aim for a schedule, but I, I, you know, I, I delay all the time and, you know, in theory I do weekly videos and in reality it's sometimes monthly. So, um, yeah, yeah that's. That, that's Look, what I do. I just make what I, I want to make. Really good, yeah, I think it's a really good point as well, though, that, you know, sometimes for someone like me where, you know, I mostly I publish to the web for lots of different articles and things. I spend a lot of time on Twitter and things like that. When I think about YouTube, I sometimes think of it just as this, like, other channel I could put things into, whereas, like you're saying, that it's its own place, you know, and there's the community there and nurturing that community and treating it as its own, you know, world is actually a key part to, I guess, um, you know, actually getting a bit of a response there. Yeah. And I like, I like my viewers. I think, yeah. I, I don't know if I've been lucky or if that happens naturally, but I actually genuinely like them and learn from them. You know, at the start, I made videos about stuff that I knew heaps about and didn't really need to research to make the, the videos. Um, and then I quickly got bored of that <laughs> as well. And I make videos now that I want to find out about, um, you know, it's an issue that I think is important and I'm interested to learn the, the details and my viewers are really good for, you know, driving me in directions of interesting things that I didn't know, experts that I might feature stuff like that. So, you know, I, I learn as much as anyone watching my videos learns. So that's makes it enjoyable for me. That's awesome. Um, so any other sort of, you know, final thoughts or tips, I guess, on the YouTube front for other people who might be thinking, I have a weird niche audience that I'd love to talk to, <laughs> you know, I know all about, you know, cheese something or others. I don't, I'm sure there's a giant cheese community on YouTube. It wouldn't take long to find Probably. it. Probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think one thing I used to worry about a lot and get really, really stressed and lose sleep over was, um, I, I was just so, I guess it was a social anxiety of some sort, you, you know, like pressing publish and like, oh, will people hate it? Will people tell me I'm stupid? Did I make a mistake? Um, you know, I would just like, agonize over that. And um, I would say to people that goes very really fast, even though I'm definitely prone to anxiety and, and stress and um, wanting to, you know, not look stupid. Um, I really don't care anymore. Sometimes I make, you know, fairly big mistakes now and you can acknowledge it and not, you know, die of shame from it. So anyone who has that as a barrier, just don't worry about it. The really great thing about YouTube, it's harsh and great, is your early videos, no one's going to watch them. And so it's like really contained the embarrassment that you might have, you know. I still have all my first videos up there and some of them make me cringe. Yeah. Um but, you know, at first, if you get 100 views, that's awesome. You know, it's 100 random people around the world that might see a mistake. All you've got to do is, you know, learn from, from what you're doing. And, and it happens pretty fast. Um, yeah, and then some practical things. The, the sound is really important. People will definitely vocally complain if the, the audio quality isn't good. But your video can be fine. No one, no one cares. So just worry about the the content and the audio quality and then you'll be you'll be golden just just get in there and do it because you can't you can't learn without publishing something it's not possible look that's a good point i'm going to take this to heart i will definitely publish this because <laughs> i i keep thinking about doing it and then i do it so rarely <laughs> but it's a great point i actually often have told other people when they're talking about really trying to work with the YouTube space is go and find their favorite person on YouTube and then go back to their very first video because almost nobody deletes their archives. And so mm. when you see that shift from, you know, somebody, that very first video where the person almost doesn't even have that kind of persona that, you know, 500 videos later and, you know, now they're like a global megastar and they've got that whole persona going but you can kind of see where they start and go oh yeah it really is just about 
switching it on and doing it regularly and just progressively, you know, like, like any skill, you get a lot better at it the more you do it. <laughs> yeah. And it happens automatically. Like you don't actually have to try for a lot of the things that you improve in. So that's nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Look, Rosie, thank you so much for your time. And of course, yes, please remind uh, listeners and viewers because this will go out in audio format as well. Um, yeah, where they can keep up with uh, engineering with Rosie. Yeah, I guess the easiest way is to just search in, in YouTube for engineering with Rosie. Um, yeah, or you can you can type it in. You, I think it's youtube.com slash C slash engineering with Rosie. Um, and then you can also find me on LinkedIn if that's your, your thing. I, I happen personally to love LinkedIn. I know that that's not cool, but, um, yeah, I, I like the community there as well. Totally different community, but really great. Um, and I'm on Twitter, but I, I hate it. So <laughs> yeah. preferably don't, don't contact me there. I think I'm Eng with Rosie on, um, on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, I've recently found I'm spending a lot less time on on Twitter because I find it just makes me angry, and more time actually on LinkedIn as well. So, yeah, because again, at least you go, you know, people are wearing their professional face and they want to talk about professional stuff and not just, you know, yeah, get upset in a professional manner. Like if you follow people <laughs> on both LinkedIn and Twitter, you know, on LinkedIn it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, I think that you've you know, missed this point and here's an article that someone wrote on it that I think is useful. And then on Twitter, they'll be like, you're a dick. And that will be like the end of it. It's just, it's yeah. the same person, but on <laughs> yeah. Twitter, they're a nice professional person who you can have a conversation with. And on Twitter, they're just a, a jerk who you immediately block. Um, yeah. so like one of these two places has actual discourse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, I love it. And Rosie, I, I, I'll find some excuse in future to talk philosophy with you as well, because I did a lot of philosophy at uni as well before I then moved up. And I found it super useful. It yeah. is a wonderful yeah, thing to yeah. help with all logical uh, exactly. aspects Logic of life. Exactly. Logic and critical thinking. It, there's not a field where you don't need those things. <laughs> yeah. No, look, yeah. that's awesome. Rosie, thank you so much for your time. And yeah, of you. course, all uh, bite side folks out there, I'm sure we'll catch you again for another episode uh, real soon. Great. <laughs> See, there you go. You got the other side of that old uh, noise. <laughs> yeah. You pick up the phone and they'll be like, oh, oh 